Uh, you know, I, I, if you're not f***ing, you're not doing sex correctly. From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. It's Friday, and Friday is still Friday no matter what the government says. Friday is Friday. They can't change that. If they try to change that, you know we're fucked. Okay? So, let's use our time wisely together, shall we? Today, we're just going to deal with uh, your questions. Here to Starting Strength Radio. Those questions come into uh, radio at startingstrength.com. And and uh, sometimes you guys send us in good questions. Sometimes you guys send us in shit. And we throw those away and we keep the good ones. And as it turns out, the board's been kind of busy. We've been getting a lot of pretty good questions, and we're going to deal with some of those today. But first, comment from, from, from the, the heaters. heaters. And this week, I don't know what's happened. Re, what These people are so fucking lame. Can... Can you guys not do any better than this? Look, Rip owns two T-shirts, and he's had them both for 30 years. <laughs> Looking extra pink today, just as expected from the greatest. Love Rip and SS. There was only one person in the gym who was not overweight. <laughs> God damn. What do you what do you mean by not overweight? I wonder who they were talking about. I don't have any idea. I don't I, what, that was Was it Bree? Was it Carmen? Was what what was this about? Was that the tour? That was the tour. Was the tour. tour. Yeah. Well, Bree and Carmen are both hideous pigs, right? <laughs> Giant sows, both of them, right? Yep. Yeah. Who else was in there? Phil was in there. Phil's a big, huge, fat pile of shit. Who else was in there? You and I are fucking obese. You and I are morbidly obese. We can barely move, you know. Devic. It must have been Devic. Freck. Freck weighs 170 pounds. Well, there you go. He was, he's a, he's not overweight. Who else was in there? Phil. Uh, I can't remember who else was. Was he there? I don't know. I, I, I've just, I guess I've just gotten so used to looking at big, giant, fat piles of shit <laughs> that it just, I don't even, it doesn't even register that there's anything wrong with that anymore. Okay. Rip is the kind of guy to slap his own ass during sex. I wonder how Adam knows that. I think we're projecting. Adam McCartney. We're projecting a little bit. Oh, this is good. I thought Rusty was a homosexual. And then some guy says, man, that Brie cutie is such a snack. And then some guy says, you're in luck. She's surrounded by a bunch of homosexuals off camera. <laughs> Brie is surrounded by sexual harassers off camera <laughs> is what she's surrounded by just in case there's a suit filed or something like well, that I just, we'll go ahead we're guilty all right she, she signed that waiver though that she can't sue for sexual harassment she did sign a waiver didn't you 
God, I hope so. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, here's a joke. So God goes to Adam and says, Adam, I'm going to make you the perfect companion. One thing, though, in order to do this, I'm going to need your nose, your right arm, one of your eyes, and your left ball. Adam thinks for a minute and says, what, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's not really a comment from the hater, but I thought I'd just include it. In comments, comments uh, from, from uh, the, the heaters. heaters. Okay. Big stack of stuff here on the desk today. We'll just take as many of these as we have time for. First one, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of topical. Dear Rip, I'd like to present you a snapshot of Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. Peter Hotez's predicted model for Harris County. This is in Texas, this is Houston. Daily number of cases into the summer. Okay. Now, he's got a uh, uh, a picture here of a newspaper story in the Houston Chronicle. And uh, the, the projection, of course, is that uh, – Everybody, uh, by June 18th, everybody in Houston is dead of COVID-19, right? Perhaps I have no place in questioning a scientist of his credentials. But this seems absurd to me, especially considering how every model we present, we've been presented has come nowhere close, and the alarmist bell ringing hasn't helped this country in any way at all. Uh, all right, let me, let me point something out now. All the models have been wrong, all of them. Every single one of them has not even been, I don't even know that you can even call them wrong. They don't even rise to the level of wrong. They're just nonsense. They're just nonsense. All of them have been nonsense. And disciplines that primarily traffic in models, like epidemiology and climate science, are prone to foolishness and abuse. Because it's very easy for public policy to be enacted on the basis of models presented by scientists that no one would question. Okay? Now, anytime you see a reference to the science, uh, where, wherein the reference says that the science should be believed, you are dealing with a stupid person. Science doesn't need to be believed. <laughs> and if, if you think you should believe science, you don't know anything about science. Okay? Science is not does not have to be believed. Science either makes, a, either proves its contention, or it it doesn't. And if the contention, if the hypothesis, the theory can be falsified, and all theories must be falsifiable before they're actually science. In other words, what would it take? For me to falsify, for me to, to show that global warming does not exist, what would it take, let's think about this very carefully, what would it take for me to present an argument that disproves the idea that man-made global warming is taking place? Is there a, a set of facts 
that I can present to you that demonstrates that global warming is not taking place. If there isn't a set of facts that I can hand you that demonstrates that global warming is not taking place, in other words, if there are no facts that you will accept that demonstrate that global warming is not taking place, then we are not dealing with science. We are dealing with religion. We are dealing with belief. Okay? That's just an example. All right? You, if, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you need to read up on philosophy of science. Karl Popper made a career of this. You should look him up. Wikipedia will be your friend. Okay? But a buddy of mine, a good buddy of mine, recently asked me what what is what is wrong with epidemiology why is it not hard science and what's wrong with it is a couple of things their data is shit and from shit data they have constructed models and models construct, constructed from shit data generate shit okay and you can do all the measuring you want but if the measurement's not accurate and if the data being generated by that measurement is shit then the model is going to be shit and we have recently seen that to be the case haven't we all right hello mr ripito sir a while back you posted a video about barbell maintenance. I was wondering about the difference in maintenance between a bearing bar and a bushing bar. I was able to acquire Chapman power bar with bearings and was wondering what to do. I need to do, wondering, do I need to do anything to maintain the bearings? I know how to maintain the shaft and the sleeves, just looking for what I need to do to the bearings. Should I leave them alone as long as they're working? The spin is still pretty good. Internet is not a great place to find the maintenance for these bars. Every video is for bushing bars. Well, the reason why all the videos are for bushing bars is because the bushing bar predominates in the market. They're much cheaper to build. And for most purposes, they're every bit as good as a bearing bar. If you put a bar together with needle bearings so that the sleeve rotates very, very freely... Uh, it's just, that's expensive. It's expensive to do that. And as a, as a result, there aren't many bars available with bearings. Uh, the high level Olympic weightlifting bars, Ilico, Usaka, uh, those types of devices are, uh, are going to be assembled with needle bearings. And, uh, you, the problem you get into oiling needle bearings is that the, the, the oil uh, attracts goo. It attracts dirt, chalk dust, that sort of thing, and will eventually gum up the needle bearings. So if I were you and I had a bearing bar, I would just keep it clean. I don't think you need to oil or lubricate in any way the bearings on the sleeve of a of a needle bearing bar they're designed to just operate flawlessly without any lubrication that's what the bearings are for okay uh not a question but an observation all right uh you should mention a michael jordan documentary you guys know about a michael jordan documentary have you so nobody's seen it. I haven't seen it. All right. So this guy says that uh, uh, Jordan uh, could not get over a hump, lead the Bulls past the Detroit Pistons to his first NBA title until he dedicated himself and his team, who followed suit, to the weight room, thus enabling him to lead the Bulls past the bad boys of the Pistons and to the Bulls and his first. NBA championship. Jordan credits this dedication to weights and the 15 pounds of muscle he subsequently added to his body with enabling him to become the aggressor and deal out physical punishment rather than take it as he had from the Pistons for the previous four years. 
If you're a Jordan fan, you already knew this story. Uh, it's just more evidence of strength being the basis of championship athletic activity. Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting observation. But of course, now in 2020, here in the far distant future, where everyone's enlightened, we have something called functional training that is so so much better than just getting stronger. Oh God, old buddy. You know, it's it's odd that we have to sit here and make an observation like this, that uh, it occurred to somebody that being stronger would make them a better performer as an athlete than being weaker. And that the modern 20, 20th century, 2020 approach to training for athletics has nothing to do with getting stronger. It has to do with getting... Uh, what? Uh, better at handling a 15-pound dumbbell on one foot on an unstable surface? I, I don't understand it. But, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, but, you know, who am I to tell a professional strength and conditioning coach of a basketball team what to do with his team? I don't even like basketball. Really, I can't stand it. It's the most boring thing I've ever seen. I, I'd rather watch golf. I really would. I'd rather watch putt-putt. You know black people play basketball. You know back, black people play putt-putt, no, too? They, they damn sure do. I've seen it happen. <laughs> Give me that racism shit. We will not brook racism here. Most putt-putt players are black. In fact, it's been my experience. Look, I'm telling you, go to putt-putt. See what's going on. All right. Hello, Rip. During the squat, my back straightens too late, causing the last part of my squat to almost be a good morning. Any cues or tips on how to fix this? Stand up earlier. That was simple enough. Some of these questions just need to be easier. So I included that one. Should elderly people over 75 and still alive do deadlifts? <laughs> Rachel wants to know this. Uh, uh, look, Rachel, it very well may be that deadlifts are the only thing 75-year-old people can, in fact, do. All right? They're a perfectly safe movement. We can get them down to 15 pounds if we want them at 15 pounds. We can get them all the way down as light as we want them. We have equipment to do that. And uh, I have uh, – I really have never – trained an old person that couldn't deadlift, you know. I mean, I've got a picture in my gym over there of my 79-year-old mother, my 80-year-old mother doing a deadlift uh, in a meet, you know, three or four months before she died. You know, you, they can all do deadlifts. The range of motion is fairly short. They got to use their hands. They can do a deadlift with some weight, and whatever that weight is, it can go up a pound next time, and a pound after that, and then a pound after that. So deadlifts are, you know, if you're worried about deadlifts, you're worried about the wrong thing. Okay. Uh, hey, Rip, awesome podcast, big fan. Bent my bar, still using it. And you can see here the. Oh wow, that's pretty bent. It's not. It's that's about as bent as number eight, yeah. the one I squat with. Over there. Uh, he wants to know if he can bench this bar. Well, you can. Uh, here's here's the deal. Uh, when the bar is bent, it is stable in this. 
position with the ends pointing down, right? In other words, you've got a high spot and two low spots on each end, and it's stable in that position. A straight bar is stable in any degree of rotation around a 360-degree axis, but a bent bar is stable when the, when the ends are pointing down. Now, if you, if you take a bench press out of the rack and the bar is not in that stable position, it's going to rotate in your hands. If you pick it up off the floor, it's going to rotate in your hands. But if you put it on your back to squat, it will not roll anywhere. It won't roll up. It won't roll down. So there's a case to be made for squatting with a bent bar. In fact, they sell that thing. What do they call it? Goddamn thing. Buffalo the buffalo bar that comes pre-bent. Mm-hmm. You just created yourself a buffalo bar. Yeah, you can use it. I think you probably want a straight bar to uh Well, you I, I you want a straight bar to clean with, for sure. You probably are gonna feel better pressing with a straight bar because it's it's more forgiving. My concern uh, would be the fact that he's probably gonna have to clamp that bar to keep those weights on. Yeah, now that that does that's need to be mentioned. Every t- if you're gonna use a bar that's bent like this, you're gonna have to use collars on the bar for everything from one thirty five up. Just get used to the idea. And you can't use shitty collars either because they will slide off. Those little shitty plastic collars are not going to work. So you've got to get some decent collars if you're going to use a bar of this bit. But they do have their uses. But collaring uh, while benching, though, is just inherent. Collaring while benching is, a, is probably a dumb thing to do uh, unless you are benching in a rack with pins. And with a with a bar that bent, a guy might want to bench press with that bar if he can't afford a straight bar in the rack with collars uh, if pins are set at the right height for protection. It's hard to get hurt on the bench if you're inside the rack with pins set. So that's enough talking about that shit. All right, Ripito, if you're reading this... <clears throat> which I am, I have a question. What are your thoughts on lowering the bar all the way to the chest in the bench press? I have heard from a few experts in movement and kinesiology that lowering it all the way down would, for most people, mean to lower the elbows far beneath shoulder level, and therefore overstretch the anterior ligaments of the shoulder capsule. That would, according to them, potentially lead to tears and permanent laxity of those ligaments, since ligaments aren't really meant to stretch. Of course, different anatomy will vary in people, like long, short arms, but this would according to these experts in movement and kinesiology, apply for the norm. And he lists the names of two apparent experts in movement and kinesiology here. Uh, Well, okay. Let's look at it like this way, like this, Anders. If everybody for the past hundred years has been taking a barbell out of the rack, lowering it until the bar touches their chest, and then coming back up, in other words, doing a full range of motion bench press. And during that period of time, everybody gets away with it without injuring their shoulders. What does that do to this theory? (laughs) In other words, if the phenomenology, if the theory doesn't agree with the phenomenology, and in this case, that theory does not, and this theory has been going around, this is 
machine based bullshit about 90 degree elbows is all you need to do we dealt with that for i heard the same silly bullshit for 40 years uh well it's if everybody gets away with benching all the way down to their chest and coming back up it's probably all right you'd probably be okay doing it right because everybody else has been coach thanks for so much for all that you do you ever notice that people are saying instead of thanks anymore when they thank you when they're they say thanks so much, thanks so much. It's just a new deal. It means I mean it. Thanks so much. It's like no problem instead of you're welcome. That that always bothers me. You know, waitress comes over, puts some more tea in the glass. I say thank you. And they say, no problem. <laughs> Why would I have assumed there was a problem? I know it's just one of these odd expressions that's given rise, that's become popular recently. Like when you order something in the restaurant. You guys ever noticed when you order something in the restaurant? And you say, you know, I think I'm going to have a cheeseburger. I want a double cheeseburger with three pieces of cheese all the way extra mustard, onions, and waitress says, perfect. And then you say, you know, hold on just a minute. Now, I, let me have the fried chicken. And she says, perfect. Well, they both can't be perfect, right? All right. Uh, so thanks so much for all that you do. Love the show and appreciate all the great information. 53-year-old intermediate lifter. While I came out of LP, I was resting about three minutes between sets. <laughs> As I have been progressing now, I'm resting five minutes between my sets. While I know it is helpful to increase the amount of time I rest between sets to make weight gains, is there ever a reason to reduce the amount of time I rest between sets? Does this cause any beneficial stress or a particular adaptation? If I held my weight steady but cut my rest back down to four minutes between sets and eventually got back to three minutes and then again began increasing weight on the bar and rest between sets, would that drive a beneficial adaptation or would that just be dumb? So, Thomas, where does that shit stop? How about five seconds between sets? Would that cause a beneficial adaptation? Five seconds between sets? How about one second between sets? Rest a shorter amount of time between sets than you do between reps. Why don't we try that? What kind of a beneficial adaptation would that result in? I don't know. I can't think of one. Uh, what are you trying to do? What is strength? If we're doing sets of five, how do you know you're getting stronger? Well, you get stronger when you lift heavier weights, right? Now, how do you lift heavier weights? Take less rest between sets so that the fatigue from the previous set is carried into the next set? Or do you rest long enough to ensure that fatigue from the previous set, not the inability to lift the weight, but fatigue from the previous set, is not a factor in your performance of the last rep of the set? If you're supposed to do three sets of five, and you're supposed to do it with 115 pounds, you might get away with three or four minutes between the sets. But if you're doing three sets of five with 545, I would suggest that three minutes is probably not enough time because the event, the set of five, is fatiguing enough that it takes longer than that to get over the fatigue. Now, I can't even believe I'm saying this shit. How many times have we had to go over this on the website? The only reason I'm saying this is because I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast. You rest long enough 
to not be fatigued when you start the next set. We're not doing cardio. We're not doing conditioning. Let your heart rate recover back down below 100 beats a minute before you start the next set. Don't be stupid. If you're, if you're, are you in a hurry? If you're in a hurry, well, go ahead. Just don't train for strength. But if you're training for strength, the most important rep is the last rep of the last work set. That's the most important rep of the workout. So what do you need to do to make sure you get the last rep of the last work set? You rest long enough between sets to enable that to take place. And if you're only resting five minutes between your sets, then you're not lifting the heavy weights. You're not lifting weights as heavy as you can lift them. Okay, so it just depends on what you want to do. If you want to do cardio, you want to do conditioning, uh, go ahead. But don't turn your work, your squat workout into a conditioning workout because that's what you're thinking about, and it's bullshit. All right? Did I address that adequately? Everybody agree with that? Yep. Well, good. All right. Now, this next one is an injury question. I've had partial tears, and he says they're 8 millimeters. In both my supraspinatus repaired about five years ago. I think he means supraspinatus tendons. I'm 60. Excellent health. 185, 190. 6'1". Power lifter. Three days a power lifts, three days a week, whatever that means, using scrupulous form. Learn from a qualified coach. Reading your book and watching your videos. Thank you. I swim competitively. Nationally ranked swimmer, five days a week. This guy didn't work. <laughs> this guy didn't have a job. He swims five days a week. He trains three days a week. He must be retired. Old retired 60-year-old guy, right? So, all oh, my left supraspinatus is all inflamed, depends, et cetera, micro tears, bother me for some time, heat, ice, rotator cuff exercises, this silly physical therapy bullshit, and not overhead pressing, I had an MRI done. Orthopedic surgeon says stop lifting heavy. Well, he doesn't even tell us whether he's lifting heavy because he doesn't tell us his weights on the bar. He doesn't tell us his body weight either. Uh... Uh, stop lifting heavy. Stop using free weights. Orthopedic surgeon says stop using free weights. I said no deadlift, no squatting. He said no free weights. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, those are all caps. No free weights. Dumbass. Did you hear what I said? I am the orthopedic surgeon and I say what you get to do. <laughs> Dumbass. After all, I am a doctor. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. So, uh, all this other shit. Uh, look, Mark, would you uh, let's, uh, do me a favor and go to the website and look up uh, my shoulder rehab video. And then go to the press chapter of the book and read about shoulder impingement, about shoulder anatomy and its relationship to the press. Okay? Do that. Because uh, your orthopedic surgeon may be a very, very good surgeon but he has no idea about barbell training. Now, this is not, this isn't unusual, is it? It's not unusual for a person to be an expert in one thing and a complete fucking moron in other things. Why, I get accused of that all the time, don't I? Ribby too. stick with lifting weights. You're fat. You're purple. Don't. Don't talk about stuff you don't know anything about. <laughs> well, 
this is my response to your orthopedic surgeon. All right. Uh, dear Rip, hope this reaches you well. I found myself being swayed toward libertarianism and understand that you are a libertarian. Be grateful for learning resources. Well, you know, I, I'm a, yeah, I guess I'm probably a libertarian. I like to think of myself as a classical liberal. Now, you need to look that up. The left is taking over the term liberal. They started that 40, 50 years ago, and they're far, they, the left has not been liberal in a long, long, long time. Okay. Uh, I'd look up definitions of terms for that. And, and uh, as far as learning resources, there are a few books that you can read that kind of set you on the right path. There's lots and lots of stuff available. Uh, anything by Thomas Sowell is excellent. Anything by Walter Williams is excellent. Uh, one of the foundation texts is is uh, uh, Frederick Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom. Uh, Ludwig von Mises' Socialism. It's an excellent book. Uh, Albert J. Nock, Our Enemy, the State. Very famous essay called I Pencil from the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, Leonard Reed. All of their stuff is, is very good. It's designed as entry-level material for, for this type of stuff. Uh, you read around in that material, and you're going you're gonna to pick up on some extremely important things. If I leave anything out, Nick, well, that's, that'll get anybody started, right? Uh, I have a feeling... And maybe I'm just being hopeful here that uh, the way the government has handled this recent situation, the catastrophic fuck ups, catastrophic fuck ups that government at all levels have made during this recent episode in the extension of public health into totalitarianism has just minted about 50 million brand new libertarians. This may be one of the unintended consequences of locking us all up in our houses so we can infect everybody in an attempt to not overwhelm a hospital system that had no potential to be overwhelmed. Uh, 50 million libertarians may just have been born. And I may be optimistic, but I think lots of you that were previously of the opinion that maybe these people do, in fact, know what the fuck they're doing have been disabused of that notion over the past two or three months and might vote differently from now on. Let's, let's hope you do, okay? Uh, let's see. Guy already had a question. All right. Rip, I've been using the starting strength method for a while now with great success. I'm not a big guy, and I've always had trouble gaining mass. Since the beginning with starting strength, I've gone from 140 to 175. He's 5'8". My squat's gone from 160 to 355. Deadlift from 140 to 400. Bench from 90 to 200. My press has gone from 40 to 125. I'm soon to enter the police academy and will unfortunately be subjected to their antiquated training methodology, which means incessant running, push-ups, and utterly useless air squats. Over the six-month span of the academy, I will not have time or, on, or honestly the energy to properly train four days a week like I have been. Do you have a recommendation for something I can do to at least maintain my current level of strength until the academy is over and I can get back on track? I worked extremely hard to get where I am, and I would like to avoid backtracking if at all possible. 
Oh, Lucas, listen, man, I know what you're talking about, but um, we've said many, many times, there's nothing that destroys a squat faster than 100 air squats. There's nothing that'll take your strength down faster than mm-hmm. high intensity glycolytic activity, like sit ups, push ups, flailing around, air squats, all this shit. Okay. Nothing is more effective. Starvation is not even more, more effective in destroying your lifts than a whole bunch of high reps at very, very light weight. So, failing your ability to at least get one squat work in a week. To try to maintain your strength. And I think if you'll think real hard, you'll probably be able to figure out a way to do one squat workout, one press workout, one deadlift workout a week. You can just do one lift at a time if you have to. But if you can't do that, yeah, you're going to, you're not going to lose all of it. You never lose all of it, but you're going to lose quite a bit of it. You won't be near as effective uh, on the job as you would be were you able to somehow stay strong? It is interesting that these people are actively working against your ability to be effective physically as a police officer, right? Uh, so you're going to have to try to squat. Just, just do one a week, you know. Do as much as you can for one set of five once a week. That'll help maintain some of it. It doesn't take that long, and it certainly is going to be worth it. But I would ask you that once you're a cop, uh, please don't arrest people for trying to go to work without a mask on. Would you? Would you do us that favor? Rip, I'm very interested to hear more about your squaring frequency. If I understand correctly, you are squatting. Finally cleared that up. Heavy once every two weeks. I get that intensity is of primary importance for those of us in our 60s. And excessive volume will crush us. My reason is this. You're squatting in the 300s while I'm squatting in the low 200s. I believe we're about the same body weight. Is the difference in our relative strength a factor in frequency? Basically, you're stronger than I am, but we're similar in other respects. Would one heavy day every two weeks be appropriate for me? And do you incorporate any light days? And if so, how are they programmed? All right, Barry, uh, there's an extremely important difference between the two of us. I've been training for 43 years, and you have not. Or you'd be squatting more than the low 200s. All right, I'm a post-advanced lifter. You are still a novice. Even at 60, you probably need to be squatting a five-pound increase in weight twice a week. What you don't need to do is squat three days a week, and what you don't need are light days. Okay? Uh, There is no reason why you can't get your squat up into the mid-300s at your age. There's no reason at all. But you just have to... You have to understand that you're a novice and I'm not. We're not comparable in any way, in any way, all right? You are a novice. You're an older novice, and you need to get the book, The Barbell Prescription, and read it and understand how we adapt training to older novices because I'm not a novice, and you are. So, no, we're not comparable at all. Uh, dearest Mr. Ripito, oh, he's he's from out of the country. So, dearest Mr. Ripito is okay. From my understanding, your preferred method of conditioning training for your athletes is using a sled or prowler. Why is this better than more typical types of cardio like HIIT which is high-intensity interval training, or long, slow distance. And how's the adaptation different? Well, there's several reasons why we don't use long, slow distance, because it's catabolic. Running 10 miles eats up muscle mass. We're trying to get strong, not eat up muscle mass. We're trying to build muscle mass. Uh, High-intensity interval training is, you know, it's fun and shit, and you could do some of that as long as you don't overdo it. But the primary reason we like the prowler 
is because we can load it to exactly the right resistance for exactly the effect we want. And you can't do that with body weight dependent exercises. The prowler is also a concentric only exercise and it doesn't make you sore. Any hit exercise involving an eccentric deceleration component is going to make you sore. This is what's wrong with 100 air squats. They make you very, very, very sore and they destroy your strength. I can't think of a better way to fuck everything up than do 100 air squats. There's no better way to destroy everything you're trying to do than 100 air squats. Okay? The prowler's good because the prowler doesn't make you sore. And if the weight you've got on it today was a little bit too easy, then you can go up five pounds on the prowler. Okay? But you have to understand that the way we define things, conditioning is always exercise. It's not training. Right? Look that up. All right. Good afternoon. What does Rip think of strongman type training in competitions? Regards. I think that strongman type training uh, should best be accomplished with barbell training. Uh, I think that strongman competitions include. Uh, a number of very specific movements that must be practiced. So I think that you train for the farmer's walk by getting your squat, deadlift, press, and power clean up. I think you practice for the farmer's walk by doing the farmer's walk. Like the previous question I just, I just answered, there is a distinct difference between exercise and training. We've written about that extensively. Go to the website, this website, Startingstrength.com, and look that up in my set of articles about this. Uh, strongman competition uh, is a is a fairly dangerous. It's a fairly dangerous sport. It's an excellent way to tear a bicep tendon loose. Happens all the time. Tire flips are dangerous. They're very dangerous. I understand the visual appeal, I understand it's fun, all this stuff, but uh, it's real, real easy to get hurt in a strongman contest. It really is. Uh, it's a lot easier to get hurt in a strongman contest than it is in an Olympic weightlifting meet or a powerlifting meet. And uh, I don't know, that's, a, that's part of the appeal, I guess, but uh, it is a... Uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. That thing started back in the late seventies, if I remember correctly. The world's strongest man. The first time they showed that, and the the whole thing has grown into a very popular sport. Some great big strong guys doing it right now. But you don't get big and strong doing farmers walks. You are a good, you're good at the farmers walk if you're big and strong. So how do you get big and strong? You train for strength. You squat. You press, you bench press, you deadlift, you power clean, you go up a little bit every workout for years and years and years until you're big and strong. And another thing you don't do is worry about your abs <laughs> if you're doing strong. Man. You can't be worried about your abs. Okay, I have a question about adjusting rep range for individuals. I heard of this thing called neuromuscular efficiency test. If I understood it correctly, that test is meant to determine the best rep range for specific athlete based of the ratio of slow versus fast twitch muscle fibers, muscle fibers he or she has. It goes like this. You test your 1RM for each lift. You rest 10 to 15 minutes. Then you load 85% of your 1RM and try to do as many reps as possible. The result you get is meant to be the best compromise between volume and intensity for a specific athlete. Most people get results between five and six reps, which correlates with your findings in starting strength program that five reps produces the best results. But there are some people that get results between one and three reps. Those 
have very high neuromuscular efficiency or eight plus which have low neuromuscular efficiency. Do I think it would be appropriate to modify a starting strength program for these extremes? No, I don't. Weak daughter, I don't. Because it's not necessary. If we take your set of five and we make it go up five pounds three days a week for three months, what has happened? You have gotten stronger, right? We know that works. We also know that eight reps will not go up three days a week for three months. And we also know that one to three will not go up three days a week for three months for a, a novice lifter the way fives will. The reason we know that is because we've been doing it a very, very long time. Hundreds of thousands of people have done it this way, and hundreds of thousands of people have determined that this approach is not necessary. Now, it's necessary for the person trying to develop the method to sell you, but it's not necessary for you to do it. Okay? Just... Just, just do the program. Uh, oh, look. <laughs> no. No, that's not, that's not what we do. Okay, over the years, I've coached lifters of both genders. I think this person means sexes. And observed vastly different behaviors between the two in a few areas, most notably. And we say genders because sex is so, it's just so dirty. Icky word. Sex is icky. Only if it's done correctly <laughs> is sex icky. All right. <laughs> Over the years, I've coached lifters of both sexes, vastly different. Notably, emotional response to success and failure in the gym. That's probably a valid observation, although it's certainly not a, it's not it's not true in every situation. I mean, I've seen kids, little boys get real, 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 real upset when they missed a third attempt cleaning jerk. And I've seen girls just dance off the platform like nothing was wrong, just like they should have, you know, so it's impossible to generalize that. But maybe over, if you look at enough people, maybe women might be prone to being more emotional about what they do and don't get done in the gym. Bree, what do you think about that? I'm pretty emotional. Are you? You get all pissed off when you miss a mm -hmm. miss an attempt? Yeah. Well, Bree's in agreement with your observation here. Behavioral response in, to correction and coaching. In other words, do women and men, can they stand to be coached uh, equally. Actually, I have found that uh, most women are more acceptance are more accepting of coaching than men because men bring a bunch of baggage into the gym with them because they already know how to do it. It's like teaching a, a, a guy how to shoot, right? How to shoot a pistol or a rifle. Most guys think they already know. Women usually having no experience with it, are perfectly willing to do what you tell them to do and are a lot easier to coach in some things as a result of that. They don't bring all this bullshit in with them off the street. Uh, underlying motivations for doing the program. Now, that's an interesting observation. Uh, if you're doing our strength program, you're doing it to get stronger because we don't tell you that it's anything except strength. We don't, we don't do this program for aesthetics. We don't tell you you're going to have abs, razor abs, as a result of doing this. We don't advise you to do a cut. We don't care about what you look like. We care about how much weight you're lifting. So if you're doing that, whether you're a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, a female or a male, uh, you're doing it for the same reason. You're doing it to get stronger because that's what our program is for. 
And fourth, a significant decline when the load nears the lifter's one rep max. As it seems, males are able to lift higher loads, respectively, while a female could do 200 for five sets of five, and the next set miss 205 for a single. This is an example, not the programming. Not to say one gender is worse than the other. One sex, you mean. Brian, you mean sex. You don't mean gender. Gender is a linguistics term. Masculine, feminine, neuter, like in German. That's, that's where the word gender comes from, but people use it now when they mean sex. Because sex is icky. <laughs> well, it ought to be. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, if you're not f***ing, you're not doing sex correctly. You're probably going to want to take that out. Now, that's icky, right? <laughs> to some people. Some people, that's icky. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, have I observed a similar pattern? Look, Brian, have you not read my article on on training females where it explains all of this? I mean, I've written about it extensively. In fact, I've written a, a follow-up about uh, women in ground combat derived from the principles I talked about in training female athletes. Those are both available on your favorite website, startingstrength.com. Really, the only reason I read this is because I wanted to say <laughs> Oh, God, all the kids watching her. Mama, what, what's... They should just Google it. Well, they, just Google it, yeah. Oh, they already knew that. Oh, okay. Hell, they know more about it than I do. <laughs> Jesus. My kids, came up, my kids came up and told me, I subscribed to Starting Strength Radio. I said, no, you didn't. I'm <laughs> <laughs> You don't have any business. <laughs> it's an adult podcast. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. I just read the books in January and February. Just begun my novice linear progression when the COVID-19 mess started. Something... That has troubled me since I started deadlifting was the cue in which you say to bend over and grab the bar without bending your knees. Hamstring flexibility, poor. Barely make it midway to my shin. All right, now look. This may actually need clarification. When I tell you to bend over and grab the bar without bending your knees, I, without bending your knees, I don't mean for you to to try to do that with your knees in absolute locked extension because you can't do that. You have discovered that you can't do that. And if you'll look in the book, the illustrations about how to set up the correct deadlift, you'll look on all of our instructional videos. Nobody is trying to take a grip on the bar with perfectly straight extended knees. That's not what we mean. What we mean is, is don't flex the knees in order to get down to the bar. Unlock your knees. Unlock the knees. As the instructions say, take your grip with unlocked knees, but don't use knee flexion to lower your hips. Okay? I think this is fairly clear in the five-step instructions. Don't you guys You think it's fairly clear? All right, so you're just you're just doing it. You're just doing it wrong. You've misinterpreted. It. Look in the book. Look on the videos. You'll see what we mean to do. Okay, now here's one. And the reason I'm going to read this is because this bonehead has been posting this on the forum and irritating me with it. How come there are three hip extension movement patterns in the program, squat, deadlifts, and power cleans, and not one hip flexion movement man i don't know can you think of a way to wait to load a hip flexion movement i know why don't we make one of the foundation lifts hanging from the chin up rack taking a dumbbell in between the feet and doing knee ups 
That's hip. That's loaded hip flexion. How do we train that? Can we go from like a five pound dumbbell up to a 405 pound dumbbell over the course of three years? And if we did that, what would have what would we have accomplished by doing so? Okay. All right, I'm going to try to explain this to you, but I don't think you're going to understand it. Hip flexion under a load is not a normal human movement pattern. The starting strength method uses normal human movement patterns under a load, but loaded hip Flexion is not a normal human movement pattern. Hip flexion occurs when you walk, when you run. So concentric hip flexion occurs when you walk and run. When you're walking and running, where is the power being applied to the ground? It is being applied in the extension part of the movement, the hip extension and knee extension Part of the movement, not the hip flexion part of the movement that brings the knee forward for the next stride. That's always unloaded. All right. Now, the hip flexors are the rectus femoris, the sartorius, and oh, maybe gracilis, maybe TFL, psoas, major, bunch of little minor bullshit muscles in the, in the hips. These are not strong muscles, and they're not, they're not positioned in a way that they can mechanically generate a lot of force in flexion because hip flexion does not have to be particularly strong because what humans do is extend. All right, now think with me a minute. All right, I had a very famous coach uh, tell me one time, uh, the following thing, and I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but he actually thought that when you squat now, that you are performing concentric hip flexion. Now, now think, of the, think of the misconception here, all right? When you've got 405 on your back, are you actually under the impression that you have to pull yourself down into knee and hip flexion into the bottom of the squat in order to get there. No, that's not what you have to do. If there's 405 on the bar, what you have to do is apply 404 to the bar and you will go down. Okay. Uh, the, the eccentric phase of the squat is called the eccentric phase of the squat because the hip and knee extensors are operating eccentrically, not concentrically. Okay? In the same way that you don't have to pull a press back down onto your shoulders from the lockout of the press, it just, you know, it, it comes back down by itself and you resist getting slapped in the shoulders with the same muscles you use to push it up. You understand? Everybody understand what I'm saying here? You don't pull yourself down. There's no active concentric hip flexion in a squat. Okay? And there's no active concentric hip flexion in anything that's loaded in the whole repertoire of human movement. So, no, we don't need to train that. All the stuff that flexes the hips gets strong just by hanging around with the other muscles when we squat, deadlift, press, power clean. Is that a sufficient explanation from the homosexuals? sitting next to Bree in the peanut gallery back here. Nobody has anything to add to that? No. No? Okay. 
Well, okay. Here's a guy from Tripoli. It says, hi from Tripoli, Libya, to the most fascinating English speaker on the face of the planet. He's referring to me. Can you? What must this guy's exposure to English have been? <laughs> previous to previous, previous to this podcast. Look up Christopher Hitchens. Okay. He may be the most uh, fascinating English speaker on the face of the planet. I'm sorry we lost him, but you'll want to look him up. I started lifting weights according to starting strength method with some personal modifications. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and it really paid off in terms of getting stronger and more visible muscles. I am a, in a novice linear progression. I have ACL completely cut playing soccer a long time ago and not operated on it. I have no symptoms. And he wants to know if it's safe to squat with an ACL tear. And should you use bands to stabilize the knee? Uh, Salama, this is, uh, this is covered in the book. So many people send these things in without having read the blue book. There's a, there's a nice illustration in the blue book about what the ACL does and how the hamstrings primarily reinforce the ACL. I don't have an ACL in my right knee. haven't had for 20 years. Uh, had a motorcycle wreck in 94, ruptured ACL, had a graft, ruptured the graft, have been operating without an ACL for 21, 22 years. Everything's just squat just fine, deadlift just fine. You don't need an ACL to squat and deadlift, and the reason why is in the blue book. There's a brilliant illustration. Brilliant illustration in the blue book that demonstrates exactly why this is and I would encourage you to read that all right now dear strength sorcerer my wife was diagnosed with hypermobility like she has a disease or something <laughs> she's hypermobile while this has made for some wonderful adventures in the bedroom. It also causes her a great deal of discomfort, especially in her hips. <laughs> when she was diagnosed, I asked the doctor if weightlifting would be beneficial, and his response was, no. boys and girls, no. ready? One, two, three, no. no. Because he's a dumbass. <laughs> God almighty. How is it so universal? I don't understand. So he went the, to the doctor to get her he diagnosed? He went to the doctor to get her diagnosed. With this wonderful woman. <laughs> talented. Talented, useful woman needs a diagnosis. All right? And the diagnosis was hypermobility, and his response to weightlifting was no. Not only did he say it wouldn't be beneficial, he didn't recommend weightlifting at all because she could become easily injured as a result and she should only do it if she really wanted to under very close professional supervision. Well, we know where she can get some of that, don't we? This was not. Or this was long before I was introduced to the wonderful world of starting strength. But even then, his advice didn't seem right to me. You know why? Because you're not a dumbass like he is. I'm not a doctor or a therapist or even a personal trainer, and that's why it made sense. Why it didn't make any sense to you is because you're not a doctor, a therapist, or even a personal trainer. You're not burdened with a bunch of misinformation and an absolute lack of curiosity to inform yourself either. I'm just a guy whose wife is hypermobile, but it seems to me if you strengthen the musculature around a joint, the joint becomes more stable and better supported, which can 
could contribute to more normal function and flexibility of the joint. Anyway, can or should my wife's drink train and could it help her condition? Okay. You know, <clears throat> flexibility is very popular. Has been for decades. But now, uh, out of California, we've adopted a new word about flexibility. Now we call it mobility. M-O-B-I-L-I-D-Y. Mobility. And the, the assumption here is that you should have as the most incredible full range of motion around every joint in your body as you can possibly obtain. And, and kiddos, that's just dumb. People that are hypermobile know that that's dumb. They're already too flexible. They're too mobile. You get injured at the extremes of range of motion around a joint. That's where joints get injured, is at the extremes of range of motion. And what restricts the range of motion around a joint to anatomically normal? It's the muscle tension that controls the range of motion around that joint. A strong muscle controls hypermobility. Now, if you are hypermobile naturally, you've got some connective tissue disorder like Marfan syndrome, or just, you know, you're just one of these little skinny women that's just hypermobile. Well, yes, it's going to benefit you to get stronger. Of course, it's going to benefit you to get stronger because a stronger muscle can control the joint position better than a weaker muscle. Now, I, he's got this down. He understands this. Uh, it's just distressing to me that this is a general observation. Doctors are such fucking dumbasses. Just amazing. As a general rule, there are there's no more there's no there's no profession on the surface of the earth that is more confident in their ability to tell you the truth and less qualified to do so than doctors. Is that harsh? You think that's harsh? No. I mean, engineers don't act that way. Lawyers don't act that way, do they? No. You know, a pediatrician who's had, you know, a couple of years of post-medical school shit, is perfectly capable of telling you to not train with weights because it stunts your growth. Just blurts it right out. Last one, by the way. Last one. Dear Mark, some background for the question. I'm really fat. I'm 23 years old and have a BMI of 40. Now, you might be pretty chubby. Prior to these trying times, I was on starting strength for only about three months, but saw all four major lifts improve progressively and lost about 10 pounds. Now in quarantine without a rack, I only have enough equipment to deadlift, overhead press, barbell row, and accessory work. Boy, this quarantine's sure been good for everybody. It's sure been a good idea. My question is, should I continue to do those lifts mentioned, or should I just commit to a more aggressive cut? With the goal to get rid of as much body fat as possible before gyms open June, July, August, September, never. I sure hope you don't live in New York. You're fucked if you live in New York. You'll there never be another gym open in New York. Won't happen. And then resume starting strength with large caloric deficit. I'm not sure if I should still be training, especially without a structured program. Please advise. Well, here, look. Basith is his name. Basith. You have to get a squat rack, right? 
You don't know for sure whether you're going to be able to train or not in the gym because the gym may not open back up until September or until, you know, you, you just don't know. You have no idea what these fucking bureaucrats and these tyrants are going to do about this business that you attend. They might not allow the business, allow the business. They might not allow the owner of the gym to use his property as he sees fit. See, they might not allow that. And they're very powerful. And uh, it may very well be that you have to train at home from now on. It may well be that you want to train at home from now on, because what do you think is going to happen the next time the possibility arises that some of us might get sick? Okay? You're already on the way to a home gym. Just go ahead and borrow the money or spend the money or whatever you need to do and get a squat rack. Uh, I, of course, prefer the starting strength rack. There are certainly cheaper ones available that allow you to do most of the same stuff that ours does. Uh, but either way, you've got to get to where you can squat. I don't know how you're pressing. You're just cleaning and pressing the bar right now if all you got is the ground. And that's not the best way to advance your press. So you need a squat rack. You can either get some squat stands or an actual power rack or some kind of device that allows you to squat so you can train at home. All right, you'll find that the starting strength rack is a, is a tremendous addition to the program and allows you to do all kinds of things you can't do right now. It allows you to bench, partials, rack pulls, all kinds of things. Uh, you're a fat guy. I understand. you got to get your diet under control. That has to be done uh, either way. That has to be done. All right? Quit drinking Cokes. Okay? Get out of love with the sweet flavor that sugar has provided you all the previous years of your life. Sweet is a child's preference. Grow. Learn to like things that aren't sweet. Learn to actively dislike things that are sweet. This will be easier if you do that, okay? But, you know, one thing that we have learned is that if we are not in control of our environment, it's better to become that way, all right? You might want to make plans to train at home. If your gym is liable to be closed, then that's kind of a, your only option. Okay, well, that's enough of this. That's enough of this shit for today. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our friends here in the studio, Bree Hillen, our production assistant. Are we calling her production assistant today? She's assistant producer. Uh, so what's what's better, an associate producer or an assistant producer? Associate. Do you know? Idea. I have no idea. Somebody knows that. Though. Yeah. Associate sounds more official. Associate producer. Okay. Yeah. She's the associate producer. Okay, I'll make sure. You're the producer, right? What's his ass do? He's a... No, I'm a director. He's the producer. He's a producer. You're the director. Okay. Got it. Well, we got or whatever, <laughs> whatever all that shit means. And thank you for being here with us on Starting Strength Radio. We'll see you next Friday. Bye now.